Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Miro Mandino. Uh, I'm working with okay. Professor Aza Bouzied uh, for New York University Abu Dhabi. So again, like today, we are going to present a paper called "Is it real generating synthetic data that looks real?" And um, so let's let's start. So. Data generation uh, is an important tool for a variety of users, from uh, teachers who want to teach statistical methods or data science, software engineers, uh, developers uh, who want to demo their system. And after this, user resort to uh, synthetic data in a variety of cases. Uh, the first case is when uh, access to real data um, sets is, uh, is difficult. Uh, for example, medical, school records, uh, income data, et cetera, et cetera. So, the second case is uh, when real data sets are um, not uh, in the right granularity. For example, publicly available, oh sorry, publicly available uh, data through initiatives uh, such as uh, opendata.gov, uh, for example, are often aggregated. And the third case is when uh, uh, real data sets are not in the right scale. Uh, data owners uh, often provide restricted uh, access uh, to a small subset of a larger and richer first-party data. And the fourth uh, case is when uh, real data sets are incomplete. Um, a poor data sample might be missing a key illustrative trends or key field uh, entirely. Um, it is important to note that uh, users view realistic data generation as a secondary but essential to a primary task. So, for example, a teacher's primary goal might be uh, to expose students uh, to data-driven decision-making. Uh, so she desires, for example, like an easy to learn and effective tool for data generation that can help uh, her to focus on her primary goal, which is building an overall lesson plan. Um, but the problem is, however, that realistic data um, generation is a technically complex task uh, with limited tools. And user can manually code the task, but that takes uh, time and expertise, of course, and especially if there are many statistical processes and relationships that describe uh, the data. Uh, they can use tools like Mocker, but uh, they're very simplistic as well. Uh, or they can use uh, simulation tools, but they need to understand how to uh, describe data, for example, using uh, Bayesian networks, which is not trivial. And finally, most of these tools do not follow how users generate data which is through an iterative and uh, interactive process where they can incrementally specify and instantly seal their data being generated. Uh, for, this, for this reason, we built SINNER, which is, stands for Synthetic Data Generation. Um, and uh, I will now introduce SINNER through a specific use case uh, and with a live demo. So imagine a social science professor who wants to help students to uh, study differences in uh, retirement age between uh, US and Canada. And she has this graph from public records that describe the data, uh, but without samples uh, for her students to apply data-driven uh, methods to. So she quickly decided to build samples that will lead uh, to these differences in income. And, and here like, you can see the fields like country, age, determined income, and country determined city. And she also has name uh, to her data to make appear like uh, it's coming from a real uh, set of people. So let's go quickly to the, um, to the demo. So you can see, I'm going to, okay. Um, you can see here that there is a, a top part where you can describe all the fields you want to uh, generate. So uh, here we type, for example, we wanted the first field to be name, and we type name as a name of uh, the column. And here you can already see that uh, Sinner is already suggesting um, the name as a possible way to populate this, um, this field. And if you click here, in fact, it's going to get uh, to be field. I'm going to, okay. Um, I'm going to generate as a name itself. So here you see a preview of the data that is already generated. And this is generated instantly uh, while we click here. And here in Instagram, uh, showing the distribution of this data. Um, so we generate another field, which is, in this case, uh, city. And here again, we see that it's already suggesting you may want to generate this field as a city. And here you see that depends on. Uh, so basically it means that you can make a uh, name depends on other things. In this case, there is nothing really. Um, it's like 
no good to think like name depends on city maybe but we can we need to do country so we want to generate another field and make city to depends on this country uh, but Cinder provides here once we add provides a way to uh, create a new field and in this case country and clicking here is creating automatically country and uh, linking them together and the way Cinder does those suggestions is basically going through the database and uh, and seeing all the relationships between uh, those, this database and in this case was able to suggest uh, that you may want to create a country and link them together of course this is no hard coded this depends on the current database tomorrow if you have an, your own use case you can load more data and more relationships and this is going to work anyway um, so we want uh, another field age and for age we do a uniform distribution uh, so the age in the slides was 1880 and uh, we generate basically age this is straightforward uh, and then we want income so income we uh, if we were the, watching the slides again like um, it depends on both age and country so we want to highlight the difference between US and Canada and as well as the more is the age the more uh, the, um, the income is going to grow so let's create this by using something called a visual relationship. So here, basically, you can um, define your age, first of all, and the income. So in the slides, I'm not sure about the correct values, but it's not important to be strict right now. OK. So let's do those income from 10,000 to 80,000 age. And uh, we can draw the trend. So we can do like the slides. Um, that we saw before and uh, in this case age for example for age 18 uh, the value 10,000 is going to be generated all the time so we may want to do some uh, noises around it and the way Sinner uh, is able to do gush and noise, noise around the, the visual um, relationships here uh, and then we create a new case uh, for a country Canada so this is basically like a switch in programming language. And we have a different behavior for in case countries Canada. And we have a different visual relationship where again um, the age and we do something different that looks like the graph before. And of course now you can see the countries are not really uh, only US and Canada. So we need to fix this. And uh, the way we can do this is by creating an expression like a filter. And this is a Boolean expression. Uh, we can say a country has to be equal to Canada or US. But in this case, uh, it's probably cleaner just to use uh, enumeration. Um, so we basically specify the two values we want to generate. So Canada and, uh, and United States. And we can even like create a distribution. So we may want to have more values coming from US and rather than Canada. So basically meaning that uh, when uh, we have uh, United States, the income is going to, um, to have this behavior here because this is the default case. Uh, it's not the Canada one. So uh, the data is going to be generated by following this one. If there is a Canada value, the other one is going to be used. So this is a very quick um, in overview. Um, so let's go uh, further and uh, okay so Cine employs uh, four main design principles uh, which I will go uh, through in detail now and the first one is visual lifting this term means uh, lifting a domain specific language into an isomorphic higher level visual language which is more uh, natural for user so a good example of this in Cinder is the visual relationships as you saw in the demo where users can simply define how two fields are related by sketching a trend and the data is generated by following that pattern. And another one is uh, uh, su su uh, supporting uh, declarative specifications. We specify that we want to have a certain distribution between these two countries but we do not say anything about how to generate them, not the algorithm behind it. Um, another principle is example-driven uh, driven interaction, and uh, Sinner infers um, what user wish to generate from column labels or values, 
uh, manually inserted into the data spreadsheet. So from few values inserted into the age column, for example, Sinner suggests a number of statistical distribution you may want to use. Uh, to avoid the illusion of precision and enhance the, the trust in the tool, um, it's important to illustrate the user that the generated data deviates uh, from uh, their idealized specifications and Sinner visualizes multiple possible outcomes for uh, a given sample size. Uh, you can see here with a larger sample size that the generated data is closer to the specification. Um, so what are the evaluations we conducted? We had two hypotheses in mind. One is that the user are going to spend less time compared to other methods. And the other one is that the user is going to, will be able to generate uh, more realistic uh, data easily with Sinner. So we asked users to generate data, uh, three different data sets where users uh, used Sinner and Mokaru and developers wrote uh, data generation scripts. And the full detail of the evaluation, of course, are in the paper. Here I'm just only showing you uh, one task, which is the children's growth record. Uh, so for children, children growth record, we ask users to generate age, sex, and height. And height depends on age and sex uh, in the plot, as you can see in this slide. And uh, on the right, you can see the, the graph that each dot represents the time um, for task completion for each user. And the black bar uh, is the mean uh, time to completion. And you can notice how in, it was generally faster to generate data using Sinner. And developers, both higher than graduate students, of course, took much longer. But finishing the task by itself is not really uh, enough. It's also important to consider how realistic data um, like how realistic is the generated data. So, but there is no really established measure uh, to, to, to measure this. So what can we do? We did something that reminds us of the Turing test. So we ask people to observe random data and tell us some rules that anyone can uh, use to determine whether or not the data set is real. For example, one rule requires that for each age uh, group there is some height variation. And specification that generated a fixed uh, height for each uh, age failed this test, for example. So we find that data produced by developers satisfy many of the realism uh, rules because developers were able to introduce a lot of customization. However, they were more prone to implementation errors as seen as the age distribution. But in general, we saw that end user produced more realistic data with Sinner. Uh, we also conducted qualitative evaluation through a post-study questionnaire. User found Sinner to be more expressive and more powerful when compared to Mokaru, and they felt that they were able to generate more realistic data as well. So to conclude, we saw that the technical challenges in creating tools uh, to generate uh, realistic data. We introduced some design principle that can help creating powerful and easy to use and generation tools. We introduced Sinner. And uh, we show how with Sinner, not only users were able to specify how to generate data more easily, but also they were able to generate more realistic data when compared um, to other tools. And so also feel free, this is, this is already a project that is uh, live on a website. And you can see here the link, uh, sinner.io. It's also open source. You can uh, download, expand for your own purposes. Uh, because this is like kind of a general purpose tool, so you, you may free you may want to expand it as well. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any question. Uh, Hi. Um, so very yeah. nice work. Um, so in your first example with the income distribution. The teacher decided to make the data more realistic by adding city, but in fact inadvertently created data in which income does not depend on city because there was no dependence there and there was nothing supported there. Now, you obviously can't prevent people from doing this, but is there any way that you could warn people of um, correlations or lack of correlations that they are putting into their data set that may, they may not be aware of? Uh, yes, so this is, uh, for example, something that we are doing uh, right now. Um, so there is, uh, like, warnings. So, for example, if you have name depends on city, which is not possible, like, uh, it doesn't make sense. Like, there is going to be a warning saying this relation doesn't make sense. Um, and, uh, again, there are, like, other warnings for relationships. So, for example, cycles uh, or, um, like, Maybe like name the boats depends on uh, two different things that are, they're not 
they are competing against each other. So all of those uh, um, you, cases are you know, borderline cases where you, you need warnings for it. And right now there are only a few of them, so for cycles and stuff. But, but there is going to be uh, other warnings as well for that, of course. I have uh, two questions or comments. Okay, sorry. Shumin yeah. Jai from Google. Uh, two questions, really. Mm -hmm. One is that, uh, can you say a bit more about the theoretical basis of your model? That, like, other than, say, it's some sort of uh, basic distribution model plus noise. Uh, so I want to hear more about that. At this for, for justifying the tool. The second is that, is Turing test applicable to problems that are not fundamentally not uh, uh, kind of a natural human behavior? Like, I can imagine judging speech or judging handwriting would be a pretty good test, but for something like even gesture typing, uh, we developed a model using minimum jerk uh, and some statistical theories uh, in, of human motor control, but we ran into this problem that would Turing, Turing type of test a good rule for judging the validity of the data because mm -hmm. fundamentally humans don't do that yeah. uh, in everyday life. Uh, okay, so to answer the first question, of course, uh, it depends on uh, the generator. So if I have uh, some slides here as a backup, so like there are different generators uh, in the uh, in the backhand side. And of course, if you want something more fancy or more uh, advanced, you can always expand and create your own generator. So right now, there are only limited amount of generators like domains and distributions. But of course, we are even working on other uh, generators that are uh, having a lot of data as an input, for example. Uh, so this is up to you depending on your use cases. This is more like a general user interface and framework for it. Uh, the second question is like uh, the Turing test. So it's not exactly Turing test, of course. Uh, it, we, we just um, has a Turing test as an inspiration. Of course, it's hard, even for human, we, we found that it's hard to judge if uh, data is real or not. So our approach more wa more, uh, was more like, instead of telling us if it's real or not by looking at this, telling uh, us um, if, um, if you, what are the rules that you think they could be useful for judging that? So it's a, it's a different approach as well. But of course, the Turing test uh, is, is a different, of course. Uh, and we can do one quick question. Maybe okay. a co on Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Mary Beth, CMU. Okay, I'll make this quick. More of a suggestion than a question. Um, there's a lot of implicit relationships in data. Like I noticed uh, a guy named Humphrey Smith is living in North Korea. That seems surprising to me um, that I saw in your demo. There's these implicit relationships that you can't really recognize computationally, but are really, really important for realistic data and for me teaching my students. Mm -hmm. um, in future tools, is there, is there sort of a way that you could have people encode these sort of assumptions that are embedded in sort of implicit signals in their data? Um. So those kind of, of relationships that depends on, on your database at the end. So the, 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 the richer the, 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 the database and the more relationships like this you can do. So right now there are only a few of them. Uh, but of course in the future, like if, if you want to expand the database, you can always do. You can always load more, um, more domain and more relationships as well. Let's thank yeah. our speaker. Sorry, we can discuss later.